the word of our Savior from St. Matthew's Gospel, the 25th chapter. Praise to you, O Lord. So hear the words of Jesus. Then the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five of them were wise. For when the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them. But the wise took flasks of oil with their lamps. As the bridegroom was delayed, they all became drowsy and slept. But at midnight there was a cry, Here's the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Then all those virgins rose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise answered, saying, Since there will not be enough for us and for you, go rather to the dealers and buy from, for yourselves. And while they were going to buy, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in with him to the marriage feast, and the door was shut. Afterward, the other virgins came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered, Truly, I say to you, I do not know you. Watch, therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise, Praise to you, O Christ. Christ. And so, there were ten young women. Jesus identified them as wise and foolish. All of them came to wait for the bridegroom. All of them came with full lamps. All of them grew tired. All of them fell asleep. But the five wise brought an extra jug with extra oil because in that time when the bridegroom would go to meet the, gr the bride, it was a surprise. It was expectation. It was celebration. And you never knew when he was going to come. And so they were wise. They brought extra oil in a jug. And so, from the beginning of time, people waited and waited for the Messiah, the Christ, the Redeemer. And in the fullness of time, God did send his son. And then, we have been waiting and waiting for Christ to come the second time. But God is not willing that any should perish. And so, we need to have a jug, yes, our lamp may have been full, but now we need the jug full of hope and trust and belief that he will indeed come again. And so there has been a song written about that, Keep Your Lamps Trimmed and Burning. Some of you may know it. Sing along with me right away. For those of you for who it is new, it is fairly simple, fairly repetitious, and you will catch on right away and then just jump in. Keep your lamps trimmed and burning. Keep your lamps, not too fast, trimmed and burning. Keep your lamps trimmed and burning. The time is drawing nigh. Keep your lamps trimmed and burning. Keep your lamps Trimmed and burning, keep your lamps trimmed and burning. The time is drawing nigh. Children, don't get weary. Children, don't get weary. Children, don't get weary till your work is done. Darker midnight lies before us. Darker midnight lies before us. Darker midnight lies before us. The time is drawing nigh. Lo, the morning soon is dawning. Lo, the morning soon is dawning. Lo, the morning soon is dawning. The time is drawing nigh. Children, don't get weary. Children, don't get weary. Children, don't get weary. Get weary till your work is done. Christian journey 
soon be over. Christian journey soon be over. Christian journey soon be over. The time is drawing nigh. Keep your lamps trimmed and burning. Keep your lamps trimmed and burning. Keep your lamps trimmed and burning. The time is drawing nigh. A little bit more. Keep your lamps trimmed and burning. Keep your lamps trimmed and burning. Keep your lamps trimmed and burning. The time is drawing nigh. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks be to God. We're seated. text for this morning's sermon. It uh, is certainly drawn from the Holy Gospel. I chose to focus most of it on the Old Testament book of Amos where he reads and he speaks to us about how you're putting on a show, stop it. Even your feasts and that which you're doing that you figure put you in a right place with God uh, stink. And so it is, get out of your complacency and seek the Lord while he may be found. So we pray. Gracious Lord, may the words of my mouth and our thoughts, the words, uh, our med the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. So grace, mercy, and peace be unto us all as it is in the name of God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Taking things for granted can very much be a huge detriment to us as people. We know it as a country, as a province, as a community, as a congregation, as a family. If I have health concerns as a person, as an individual, I can ignore that which is going on to my detriment. Uh, we've all heard that statement that taking things for granted or complacency hurts us. We've heard that many times. As drastic as the statement sounds, it's not restricted to all kinds of uh, big business, but it's a personal reality. Complacency doesn't only kill, as we celebrate Remembrance Day, it doesn't uh, kill veterans, war soldiers, uh, policemen, fire department people, but it kills individuals. The devil would want us to let our guard down. The devil would want us to say we can get through with the steam that we have, but in reality we need God's grace. We need the Holy Spirit working through the Word, and the Word does, as long as we're in the Word, and it's to God's glory and to our benefit. Complacency within the congregation though is very difficult to counter except by God's word. And as we turn our attention, as we've already read and marked and inwardly digested the Old Testament and the gospel readings and the epistle appointed for this morning, we hear our Lord speaking very clearly on the deadliness of just letting things coast, letting things go. The Israelites of old, as well as the disciples of Jesus, had a bad habit of falling into letting things go, into complacency, and so do we, truth be told. Back to the Israelites, though, they figured that human nature was just going to take its course, God would be with them all the time, and they would be carrying on letting things be. So how could they do such a thing? Um, they just did. That's life. That's life then and there, and that's life here and now. And we're all guilty of that in many ways. Because we want to have consistency. We want to have normalcy. And normalcy of the world would be to be at enmity with God. And so, as we saw in the Old Testament lesson, complacency came in the form of simply, as I said it twice already, going through the motions. Notice that they were technically doing all the right things. 
Old Testament people of Amos. This is they. They were meeting on the appointed time on the Sabbath. They were sacrificing. They were singing. They were mourning when the time was right. They were holding festival Thanksgiving feasts. They were checking off the right boxes, jumping through all the right hoops, putting forth the image of good and faithful people. However, the reality that they were offering all these things up to God their father, creator, provider, had long ago been pushed into the background, going through the motions. They replaced instead with feelings of resentment, boredom, apathy. It's like, ah, oh, do I have to do this again? And for us, do I have to go to church again? No, nobody needs to go to church. But hopefully we can take to heart the scriptures, certainly in the Psalms, when the psalmist said, I was glad when they said, let us go to the house of the Lord. Let's get up and go. And put in David context, my context, to say that when I am able to be in God's house, where God's word is proclaimed, you're preaching it, or I'm listening, or vice versa, is that... God's blessings are upon me, and it's more than a feel-good that God works his work of strengthening my faith. And then, so it's a, it's, a, it's a no-lose situation. I am strengthened by being in God's house, by going to church. It doesn't matter whether I live in Camrose or next door or Edmonton or wherever. I pray that that would be the same, that I would be blessed for no pay, for little pay, for whatever pay. It's not about pay. God gives us way more than what we deserve. And he doesn't give us what, doesn't give me what I deserve, which is everlasting damnation or a good swift kick in the pants. And so it is that when we come to church, when we come because God would have us have so many blessings, then we're blessed, and then we're blessed to be a blessing to others. Other people are blessed by our presence, by our encouragement, by our contribution. And so it is, though, the people in Amos's day, Amos was a prophet, and he says, you know, you guys and gals, you're going through the stupid emotions. You're going through those things which don't put any traction underneath you. It's a waste. They're putting on an image, so they're being hypocrites. That's what Pastor Greg spoke about in our Bible study this morning. God would have us be sincere, as in meaning from the heart. By their fruits you'll know them, say the scriptures. Yeah. They didn't need to do all these things every Sabbath. A bunch of them would say, after all, they were Jews. Christians today would say, I don't need to go to church every Sunday. After all, I was at confirmation. People in Amos day, they were God's children chosen, chosen of Abraham, of Moses. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is the typical line. They surely covered over missing a few services by being children of Abraham, of not being on fire, genuine in their faith and trust. You see, their worship and praise, their faith and action had essentially become a hollow core, an empty shell of what God had originally intended his people to have. And God was not content to simply let it go, so sending Amos. He's the guy who took the plumb bob, and he says, you know what? That wall is pretty crooked. And who's the wall? The wall, that's Israel. You're pretty crooked and perverse. When you should be straight, you're crooked. And so Amos, God through Amos, he showed his divine and fatherly love by warning them, the people of Israel then and there, and us here and now, about the punishment that awaits such a counterfeit and empty faith on the day of judgment. So race ahead, fast forward 800 years, and we still hear Jesus speaking to his disciples, warning them of the same deadliness of complacency and apathy. The oil that the foolish virgins lacked was personal saving faith in Christ. And it's not of our works. It's a work of the Holy Spirit through the word. 
So notice, as Carolyn said, they didn't start off with oil in their lamps. Or they, they did have some, but it was given to them by God through faith. And as Carolyn said, they brought the wise ones had a jug of extra. They had an extra container. The monotony of, and sense of self-security, though, of everyday life, it took its toll on all those women in Jesus' account. They all became tired and, and just, uh, they needed rest. And so it is. It's important to point out that there were 10 of them, they all fell asleep after they all became tired. All were guilty of becoming complacent to one degree or another. And that fits in line with the scriptures saying, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. All fell asleep. However, the wise virgins are called wise because they continued to keep their lamps full for later, in spite of their grogginess. The five foolish virgins, however, let their lamps burn and go out, never bothering to think about anything other than the immediate here and now. Who cares about later? When the time came, their foolish complacency led them to foolishly believe that they could simply get into the feast with someone else's oil or come later with someone else's repentance and faithfulness. What a shock it was for those five foolish virgins to discover that that isn't how it works. For the groom then and there, for God then and there and here now. Their complacency put them in a deadly tragic position of complete emptiness when they needed oil of saving faith, repentance saving faith was needed most. So, brothers and sisters in Christ, where does our Lord promise to refill our lamps each week and every week? It's right here in His Word and in His sacraments. He free, Himself freely gives us the very oil of life that we need. I believe that it cannot by my own reason or strength believe in Jesus Christ as my Lord or come to Him says Luther in his explanation to the third article of the Apostles' Creed. But the Holy Spirit calls me by the gospel, enlivens me with his gifts. The same way he calls, gathers, and enlivens, and enlightens the whole Christian church on earth and keeps it in the one true saving faith in Christ Jesus. So that's the one point of this parable that's often overlooked. The five foolish virgins, after they were confronted with that ugly fact that somebody else's oil, or they had to run out and get some extra oil. It wasn't going to cut it for them. They tried to go out, and it didn't work. They didn't have saving faith as the other five ones. So think about it. It's the middle of the night. Uh, the gas stations aren't open, really. It, they would have had to pound on doors to get a bit of oil. The merchants, shopkeepers have closed up. The opportunity to receive oil had long been passed. They had ample opportunity earlier. They had squandered it. How many people do you know, honestly, who believe that since their mom and dad are Christians, or their forefathers, foremothers are Christians, they're going to be in heaven? Or it's okay. How many people do you know who wrongly believe that they're getting into heaven because of some other belief other than in Jesus. Again, the Bible study talked of these we condemn as, as Lutheran Christians, the Mohammedans, those that don't have faith in Christ, the Arians, the Manachians, um, the, the list goes on, and there's still more. It's not native spirituality. It's Jesus who has saved us, saved me from my sins, the penalty of our sins. So believing and, and thinking, well, my uncle or my father or mother are going to church, that's okay, but it's not for me, doesn't cut it. Amos talks about and reminds the people then and there, Jesus then and there, and to here and now, saying it's faith in Christ for me. For each of us, God knows us by name. 
He knows everybody by name. He engraved us in the palm of his hands. Everybody. And that's amazing. So how many people do you know who are on the very foolish 11th hour plan, if we want to call that, of salvation? They're going to do what they want in the here and now, and they'll repent and give their life over to God when the time comes up. On their deathbed. It's not a good plan. Scriptures don't recommend it. Remember Ecclesiastes, Solomon says, Give to the Creator in the days of your youth, that it may go well with you. And even when that happens, when that's a case, and hopefully it's a case lots and through and for us, is that troubles will come. We don't look for them. Troubles and heartaches and changeabouts, grief and sadness. And that's why hopefully we come to church, because we can share our mutual woes, our mutual burdens bear. It's an old Swedish proverb, I'm sure you heard it lots, is that a sadness shared is a sadness in half, put in various ways, but a joy shared is a joy doubled. And so we share. If we can have talk therapy, just sharing our troubles, then it's not as bad or sad for us. And that's where God calls to pray through St. Paul and through others, pray constantly in every circumstance, give thanks to God, for that is the will of God in Christ Jesus, our Savior. So we're called to be a people of prayer, called to be a people who are wise, like the wise virgins, of saying, how could I gather up? How can I be strengthened in my faith more and more? That's the oil that God talks about, knowing that his grace is sufficient for us, even though we might not have what we seem to need for this day. And yet God provides us our every needs, all of our needs, and even more so that we can share, pressed down, shaken together, overflowing. And so fa the fact is none of us don't do what we should or as much as we should or could. And yet God says to us in Christ, I am with you always. Matthew 18, 20, uh, 28, 18 and following, right at the end, I'm with you always to the end of the age. So watch, therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. They often go in one ear, out the other. Our words and deeds betraying our complacent foolishness too. And so does that mean that all hope is lost for us? Are we actually the foolish virgins and the ignorant, hard-headed, apathetic Israelites that our scripture lessons talk about? Well, we can go back to Luther. We're simul justus apicator, same time saint and sinner. That's us sometimes. Yes. Sometimes I'm like a foolish virgin or a foolish guy without any gas. We don't need to blame the virgin. It's just a, uh, a, 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 a point of speech. It can be foolish guy that doesn't have gas in the tank and you run out. And so we are all sinners. Hope is lost for us at times, and yet God comes into our hardness and our lostness and says, I love you. And the weeping and gnashing of teeth, that will be there for those who aren't in Christ. God's grace and mercy are greater than my greatest foolishness, my greatest complacency. By his grace, God's grace, like the five wise virgins, he does enable us to keep our eyes and our ears focused on the coming of our heavenly bridegroom, Jesus, who has come and who will come again, who we're waiting for his second return. There's a whole bunch of people say, well, it's, we're in the end times. Yeah, we have been in the end times since the Bible, since St. Paul's time. Watch and pray for every generation that is true.
by God's grace and by the working of God the Holy Spirit, we do keep our eyes of faith focused on the all-redeeming cross of Jesus Christ. So Jesus, you have shepherd and friend. The empty cross where Jesus suffered and died for my sins, giving me forgiveness and life and salvation, giving you forgiveness of sins, life and salvation. Even though somebody would say, I don't forgive you, I can't forgive you, by their actions, those are pretty clear for lots of people. And so God in the flesh, Jesus, he is with us, giving us salvation. Even though at times we're admittedly groggy, half asleep, and complacent. Through the gifts of God's own word in the scriptures, brought to life through the reading and the preaching of God's word, and the sacraments that are given for us, holy baptism, reminding us that we are made part of the body of Christ through water and the word, the sacrament of the Lord's Supper, take, taste, and see the goodness of the Lord given and shed for the forgiveness of our sins. Through those means, our lamps of faith are continually filled and replenished by him, by God, with his life-giving grace and mercy forgiveness. The catch, God isn't one of tricks or catches or coupons to bring us in, but I guess we can call it the thing about it is, is that hopefully we're here. The thing is, that we've got to be here. Taste and see how good the Lord is. This is where God has promised to freely administer his gifts, to freely and fully fill our lamps with his oil of life and saving faith. And it's not at the golf course, not in the woods. Maybe you heard this before. It's like if you if we like, and I have even family members who say, I don't need to go to church. Um, I can be in the woods. God's in the woods. So the question is, well, when was the last time that you had a monkey give the sacrament of the Lord's Supper to you? Or a bear or a wolf? Or your fellow golfer? Or, or you're sitting in the bar saying, I can have church in the bar, and a drunk buddy comes over and gives communion. No. It's not on the golf course, most of all, where we have the, word, the, mini, the ministration, the sharing of God's grace. Not in a fishing boat or in a bed in front of a television or computer or an iPad. Not in some counterfeit store or church that peddles off uh, imitation stuff that give us false, warm, fuzzy feelings while leaving us empty and ill-prepared and sitting in the dark. Oh yeah, and sends us a thing because they want more money. This is where the bridegroom is, Grace Lutheran Church. And the bridegroom, still wherever God's word is proclaimed, Messiah Lutheran Church, Bethel Lutheran Church, yes, even Baptist churches, or in our Roman Catholic church, wherever the holy Christian church is gathered. But certainly here, by God's grace, in Grace Lutheran Church, God replenishes our faith Charges our battery, as my mom said. We go to church that our battery gets charged, that our gas tank gets filled again. And God prepares us for the day, the day ahead and the days ahead, feeds us, nourishes us. We'll still have the aches and pains of the days, and yet God's grace is sufficient in the midst of and through them. So right now, right here, thanks be to God for his undeserved mercy and grace. We have so much to celebrate. And whenever I read these lessons for this Sunday, I can't help but think back to the truth of the old saying that we began with a sermon, complacency or taking things from, for granted is truly deadly. Taking things for granted can kill far worse than we could ever imagine. May our Lord and Savior continue to grant us the strength, the endurance, the courage, the wisdom, the faith that we need, faith in Christ to stay vigilant, to stay awake, 
and, of course, to rest and to sleep in God's grace, but have our faith awake, actively focused, not on our bank account or our investments, what they might or might not do, but on the saving work of Jesus, who is far better to have than any other in the world, other thing or person. He alone, Jesus, is our source, sole source of life and light and salvation. And so may he replenish you and me and fill us with his life-giving, life-saving gospel, the good news, Jesus loves you, loves me, wants to shine his love through us to a world that is dark and fallen and seems to be getting worse every day. In the midst of that, we have nothing to fear. May you always be prepared to joyfully meet your Lord, our Lord and Master, when he comes again. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus, come. And may this be our prayer and our reality. May this same gospel light of Christ be witnessed in all that you say and think and do. May it be witnessed through you and not in spite of you or me. In his name and to his glory, in Jesus' name, amen. And the peace of God which surpasses all of our understanding, guard and keep our hearts and minds in the one true faith in Christ Jesus, both now and to life everlasting. Amen.